In this episode of Idea City, one of the most famous was by Charles Gounod, a French composer, who took uh, a prelude from the well-tempered clavier, Bach's great work for solo keyboard, added a melody, uh, threw in the words from a Latin prayer, and created this uh, overnight kitsch classic, Ave Maria. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. Pablo Casals found the score of Bach's cello suites in a Barcelona market in 1890 when he was 13, and he practiced it daily for 12 years. So Eric uses that at the basis uh, of uh, a story in which he tells the stories of Bach and Casals and his own exploration, discovery, and love of music. Eric? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here along with my iPod, which I will hopefully connect unencumbered by um, the rocket science we've just uh, participated in. I'm going to talk about the transformations of music, how we transform music and how music transforms us. I'll start with the music that transformed me, what we're listening to right now, The Cello Suites by Johann Sebastian Bach. I stumbled upon this music actually uh, coincidentally not far from here, although I live in Montreal. It was just around the corner from here at the Royal Conservatory of Music that I first heard this music. And at the time, there was a great deal of music in my head. It didn't sound anything like, like Bach. It sounded a bit more like this. I was a pop music critic at the Montreal Gazette. And although I liked very much writing about music, I ultimately found that it wasn't going to be my life's work. And when I wonder why it was that I stopped doing what strikes many as a dream job, I often think back to the band that's playing this song. They're called Hansen, and they consist of three brothers who were very, very young, first off. Their combined ages added up to about 42. They're very blonde, very cute, at least so thought the thousands and thousands of 12-year-old girls who were screaming nonstop at this concert. Most of these girls were wearing braces, which gave the screams a, a particular metallic edge. And... And I remember engulfed in these screams, saying to myself, Eric, this is not a job for an adult. <laughs> so by contrast, solo cello music by Johann Sebastian Bach seemed very adult. After the, the manic energy of pop music, uh, there was something exquisitely minimalist about this. And the scene itself was really striking. Um, it was a solitary cellist uh, with a shock of white hair, dressed in formal black attire, and bent over this majestic instrument that had been built back in the 1600s. And the music that was pouring forth was, you know, was, was so glorious and, and earthy and ecstatic that I wanted to look inside the sound holes of the cello and see whether there weren't several miniature musicians hiding in there inside somewhere, producing music that was so lush and intricate and uh, full-sounding. And so I embarked on a quest to get to the heart and soul of this music. And one of the first things that anybody researching the cello suites learns is that Bach's original manuscript, thought to have been written sometime around 1720, disappeared. A number of other manuscript copies subsequently surfaced, but there are contradictions and differences among them. And what this manuscript disappearance means is that we can't be sure precisely how Bach wanted this music to sound. And so every cellist who tackles the music, in fact, 
has to put their own poetic stamp on the music. They have to take some poetic license. In fact, they have to reinvent the music. And this, I think, goes a long way towards understanding Bach's greatness, certainly his longevity. And I'm wondering whether it also holds a clue about the future of music in general. So what I'd like to do is look at how past music becomes future music, using the, the test case of Bach, trying not to trip in the chords here and not have the uh, jack fall out of the iPod. Um, and use Bach because it's been Bach's music, I think, that's been so thoroughly and successfully transformed over the centuries. Let's start with the cello suites. What we're listening to right now is the, the opening prelude of the first cello suite, and it's on guitar. Although the cello suites were, so far as we know, written for the cello, it sounds amazingly convincing, I think, on guitar. And not only guitar, if we take an instrument sort of far removed from the cello, the flute. Sounds good to me. How about uh, my personal favorite these days, the marimba. Which uh, a friend suggested yesterday sounds a bit like champagne bubbles. Another instrument for and a Bach, the saxophone. And if we wanted to hear it more fleshed out harmonically, we could try the piano. Now, I think the inescapable conclusion is that all these instruments carry it off remarkably well. And this is part of Bach's genius. His music seems to transcend particular sonorities, individual instruments. It's the changeability of Bach's music that I think has everything to do with his, his music's longevity. Now, the changeability of Bach began early on with the old Baroque master himself. And Bach was in the habit of rewriting his own songs. He would take, say, um, a harpsichord concerto and turn it into a violin concerto. He'd uh, convert a cantata, say, into uh, an organ solo. And he even took one of the cello suites and turned it into a lute suite, which is what we're listening to right now. And I think this is... Uh, so convincing that uh, it's hard to imagine which came first in Bach's head, the cello or the lute. When we come back... This is uh, the smash mega hit of 1967, A Whiter Shade of Pale by Procol Harum. Probably is familiar to a lot of people here. Um, it was a progressive rock item with this very catchy organ riff. What a lot of people don't know is that the catchy organ riff was, uh, was borrowing heavily from Bach's air on the G-string. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. Now, Bach died in 1750, and his music was all but unheard of, certainly in the public realm, for a good 80 years after his death. It took the 19th century romantic composers, composers like uh, Mendelssohn and Schumann, to start playing Bach. They often rewrote Bach, incidentally, for the piano, which was their instrument of choice, and put Bach on the map again. Schumann, in fact, uh, wrote one of the cello suites, the third one, for cello and piano, thinking that just cello was going to be overly demanding for the audiences of his day. Now, this song wouldn't see the light of day for more than a century, in Schumann's hands, but other composers would rework Bach with a lot of success in the 19th century. One of the most famous was by Charles Gounod, a French composer, who took uh, a prelude from the well-tempered clavier, Bach's great work for solo keyboard, added a melody, uh, threw in the words from a Latin prayer, and created this uh, overnight kitsch classic, Ave Maria. wait for the lyrics to come in. Now other composers followed suit. Uh, they tended to take small bits and pieces out of Bach's colossal works and create these um, 
these well-packaged, nifty, catchy little items. But the 20th century was just around the corner, and it would be less relaxing and more radical in terms of the reworkings of Bach. One of the big names early on was the conductor Leopold Stokowski. And Stokowski was enormously popular and influential, and he created these lush, brash, larger-than-life orchestral transcriptions of Bach. And they still resonate. And I don't mean to scare you with this, but this is Halloween spooky Bach. the second movement from that piece, the Takata and Fugue in D minor. If you happen to be seeing a movie in 1940, a movie called Fantasia, you would have heard this song. It figured prominently in the film. It pioneered the use of stereo. It showed the conductor Stokowski shaking hands with Mickey Mouse. And it also, I think, introduced Bach to a more popular audience. Now, by this time, the other genres of the 20th century had taken notice of Bach, they took hold of him and they really wouldn't let go. Jazz was an early adopter. And I think one of the most glorious transformations of Bach in the, in the jazz idiom was by Jacques Lussier, a French musician, who put, Jacques, who put Bach in this sort of jazz swing blender and the results are quite spectacular. To show you how, how fabulous it sounds, I thought I'd take the same piece by Bach, the Italian concerto, and uh, play it first uh, in the hands of Glenn Gould, which is more or less a straight classical spirit, and then follow it up with Jacques Lussier. So here's Glenn Gould. That's, it's hard to hit the stop, bot, the stop button on this when Gould is playing Bach, but Here's Lucier with the same piece. It's amazing that these are the same notes that we just heard, but just so, you know, thoroughly uh, rearranged. Now, a really nifty translation, and an unlikely one, was the Swingle Singers in the early 1960s. They were an eight-part chorus that specialized in the swing singing of Bach. And they did very well in 1964. They came home with a, a Grammy for Best New Recording Artist. But rock and roll, in any case, would, would assimilate Bach. This is uh, the smash mega hit of 1967, A Whiter Shade of Pale by Procol Harum. Probably is familiar to a lot of people here. Um, it was a progressive rock item with this very catchy organ riff. What a lot of people don't know is that the catchy organ riff was, uh, was borrowing heavily from box air on a G-string. A year after this song came out, there was a, uh, a really pivotal album called Switched On Bach, 1968, won Walter Carlos, soon to become Wendy Carlos, although that's another transformation that we won't get into, <laughs> released this album of uh, some of Bach's uh, best-known works, um, in fact, electronic transcriptions of these works, played on a newfangled instrument, the synthesizer. When we come back, 
Um, as time goes on, the future is going to be incredibly accommodating, I think, for music that can transform itself with such resilience and eloquence. Get the latest Idea City news instantly. Follow us on Twitter. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. But every generation, every generation, it seems, reinvents Bach on its own terms. And I could pile on the examples right up until the present day, but uh, let's pause for a second and raise the question, why Bach? Why has Bach been so thoroughly transmogrified, translated, transmuted, you name it? And there's not an easy answer to that question. A few theories have been floated. Um, one, for example, that there's something about the steady nature of Baroque music, the steady rhythm that lends itself to transformation. And that's true. Another is that uh, Bach's use of counterpoint, which relies on the overlapping of separate voices, also lends itself to reinvention. And I think that's equally true. But it doesn't explain why, again, it's been Bach time and again, and not his Baroque colleagues, Handel, Scarlatti, um, Vivaldi, who've been transmogrified to nearly the same degree. Another theory which I think is really intriguing suggests that Bach's reportedly great skill at improvisation is somehow embedded in his music itself. And this would mean that uh, musicians of a certain talent and creativity can, can access this, this incredible reservoir of Bach's own improvisational talent. And I find that sort of a comforting and uh, and convincing theory in many respects, but ultimately I think we can't explain for it so easily. We don't know. All we can say is that Bach's longevity and his greatness is very much bound up with this changeability factor. There's something, there's some inner power, I think, in Bach's music, something indestructible that somehow survives not only the centuries, but uh, instrumental changes, uh, genre changes. There's just something to the music. It's as if changeability is, is really one and the same with his, his longevity. And this may be hard for us to think of in, in precisely this way because we're used to thinking, I think, of classical music as being these immutable masterpieces that are passed along from generation to generation. Not stuff that's so malleable as we're hearing now. But I think that there is a direct connection between Bach's changeability and what we love about him so much. So I find myself thinking more and more about covers and remixes and tributes. Um, I think in the near future, it's hard to know what the future holds, of course, for music, but it wouldn't surprise me whether we're going to be able to do our own remixes. We're going to have devices that enable us to, to tinker with the tracking of individual songs. So say we can take um, the vocals and acoustic guitar out of a lushly orchestrated song, or we can get rid of the vocals altogether and, and make it an instrumental song. We may be able to, on the other hand, listen to music according to synthesia, whereby specific tones produce specific colors or aromas. On the other hand, we may choose just to listen to our favorite music in a different cultural setting, say Bach blended with the West African rhythms of Gabon. On the other hand, we may opt for our Bach with uh, the East Indian rhythms of the tabla. The more you guys cheer, the more he gets into it, man. That's how you do it. We may, on the other hand, opt for Bach with turntablism and scratching. This was taken from a, uh, a DJ competition in Oregon. Not every classical connoisseur's cup of tea, but perfectly drinkable, I think. Or if we wanted to think of really upbeat music, we could do no worse than to say marry Bach with the infectious strains of, of Cuba. Uh, this is an arranged marriage, but a very happy one. Uh, Bach's Brandenburg Concerto 
fused with Cuban music. So I think I'm going to end on that note, on all these notes, on these uh, wonderfully changeable notes, feeling that um, as time goes on, the future is going to be incredibly accommodating, I think, for music that can transform itself with such resilience and eloquence. Thanks very much. Eric. Thank you. We share a calling, Eric. We we want to turn people on to classical music. Thank you. In some sort of uh, spontaneous flux, highly intimidated by the planet savers and the uh, astrophysicists and the rocket scientists and the paper plane crafters, so that I was just uh, moving on pure adrenaline. But I, I think it was fun. I think when you work with music that's fabulous sounding music, you can't really go wrong. So I had a great crutch to lean on.